morning. Welcome to Potomac Hills. Please stand and join us in worship. Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Chosen seed of Israel's race, he ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Amen. Please have a seat. Good morning, everyone. That was anemic. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Good. Welcome. Welcome to the worship of God with the people of God here at Potomac Hills Presbyterian Church in Leesburg, Virginia. We're glad you're here. And if you are joining us online, we're glad you're there. And uh, hopefully you can come and worship with us in person one of these days. Uh, we are, uh, it is the Lord's Day. And uh, I rejoiced when I heard them say, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so we are here. Uh, we're, uh, this morning, uh, Pastor Silverdale is uh, out of town, he's planned to be that way, but Frank Wong did not plan to have COVID. So he is still, I don't know if he's still positive, but he's still recovering. Uh, and so this morning, our, uh, the word of God will be delivered to us by Reverend Jagar Chinavan from First Asian Indian Presbyterian Church in Herndon. So he'll be sharing God's word with us, and we're looking forward to that. Um, a few announcements just to kind of uh, highlight, of course, there's youth group this week at Exeter. But community groups start today. So if uh, these are wonderful opportunities to be plugged into the church and we would encourage everyone to uh, participate. There is, uh, uh, there's all, they meet, most of them meet Sundays, if I remember right. Uh, is, there, is, is there a group that meets on a weeknight? No? Everybody's Sunday? Okay, everybody's Sunday this, this year. Um, there is one online group, and that's the one that I participate in with uh, Piccioni, so if you can't make it in person, there is that. There are community groups with child care. So uh, uh, everybody has that opportunity. There is a uh, fall kid stuff swap. That that's two weeks from yesterday, October 1st. So that's uh, 
Uh, please be aware of that. And then two weeks from today, there will be a fellowship lunch after the service. All right. With that, let us turn our attention to the worship of God. We'll be reading responsibly from Ephesians chapter 6. Let us uh, do so. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers, powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all of the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Let's pray. Father God, you inhabit the praise of your people. We pray that you would do so this morning here in this place in our worship, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord God, we are a people of unclean lips. We are a people who need your grace. We are a people who need your mercy. Do so, Lord. Touch us. Inhabit our praise. Fill our hearts with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you please stand and join us in continuing the worship? Forever God is with us forever. 
My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. God be merciful to me. On thy grace I rest my plea, plenteous in compassion thou, blot out my transgressions now, wash me, make me pure within, cleanse, oh, cleanse me from my sin. My transgressions I confess, grief and guilt my soul oppress. I have sinned against thy grace, and provoked thee to thy face. I confess thy judgment just, Speechless, I thy mercy trust. I am evil, born in sin. Thou desirest truth within. Thou alone, my Savior, art. Teach thy wisdom to my heart. Make me pure, thy grace bestow. Wash me whiter than the snow. Gracious God, my heart renew. Make my spirit right and true. Cast me not away from thee. Let thy spirit dwell in me. Thy salvation's joy impart. 
death fast make my willing heart. Sinners then shall learn from me and return, O oh God, to Thee. Savior, all my guilt remove, and my tongue shall praise Thy love. Touch my silent lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall praise the cold. Amen. Would you please be seated? Turn now to our uh, time for prayer. And before I do that... Um, I meant to share this with the in the announcements, but I read something recently that talked about that two of the most important minutes in the church life of a church is the two minutes after the worship service. We all kind of flood. Some people rush out. Some people, oh, I need to talk to so and so and so and so before we leave. And but the challenge is to speak to someone that you don't know or someone that you don't know very well. It may be someone that you don't know, maybe a, a member of the church, our family in the church you don't know well. Let me challenge you to, to do that today after our worship that uh, you might uh, find somebody, look around, see who that might be, and talk to them for a, a minute or two. And, uh, and then you can go on about your business. Thank you very much. Uh, our prayer today, as, as we have uh, in recent months, is responsive. It's behind me. I'm believing by faith that it's behind me there, right? Um, and so we'll read responsively. Uh, you all will we'll read together the bold parts. So from Psalm 42, let us pray together. <clears throat> as a deer plants for flowing streams... So pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before you, God? My tears shall be my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go the throng and lead them in the procession of the house of Micah with shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise him, my salvation and my God. Heavenly Father, this world often distracts us from you. We often find ourselves so busy, but we are reminded by your word of our longing for you. We know that in this world is dry. We find our refreshment in you. We come before you with thirsty souls. Help us to hope in you so that we will be lifted up, encouraged, and strengthened as long as our hope is in you. We have nothing to fear. We long for the day when we will see you as you really are, no longer in a mirror dimly, no longer in our sin-distorted imaginations. Then we will be made like you in glory. We will not only see, but also share in the glory you had before the foundation of the world. But we're not there yet, and so we worship today and go back to work tomorrow, we commit ourselves to be your willing servants. There is no greater joy to serve you. Each of us grace and faithfully serve in the place we live for us. Wives, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, employers and employees, teachers and students, friends and co-workers, leaders and congregation, young and old, healthy and sick, 
weak and strong, each of us has an important part to play, a commission to fulfill, a place to serve. Sovereign God, we pray on behalf of your church throughout the world for this congregation and for our sister churches here in Potomac Presbytery. Fill their pastors with your Holy Spirit and bless their worship services in person and online of Harvester PCA, Springfield, Virginia, and their pastors, Reverend Mark Hayes and Reverend Dan Dahl, and Crossroads PCA in Woodbridge, Virginia, and their pastors, Alex Young. Lord, prepares our hearts, hear our prayer, and all these spoken and unspoken requests, we pray to you in the sovereign name of Jesus Christ, our Son, our Savior. Amen. So pray, can, let us continue to pray here, and I'll, be, I'll pray and pray along with me. I'll be, last week I taught Sunday school on Psalm 87, so I'll pray through Psalm 87 this morning. Um, so... Let us turn our attention. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O God. Lord God, we know that you love your people. We are your people and the sheep of your pasture. Lord, it is not because of anything inherent in us or anything that we have done to deserve your grace, but you have chosen us like you did Israel out of the midst of a people. You've cared for us and you have made us your people. You inhabit the praises of your people. Even among nations, foreign nations who are here, among those who know me, I mention Egypt and Babylon, Philistia, Tyre, and Cush. This, was, this one was born there, they say. And of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were in her. For the Lord himself will establish her. The Lord records as he registers the people. This one was born there. Lord, in the... Uh, in the days of the land of Israel, there were strong and mighty nations all around them. Uh, your people were a small people, and yet you chose them. You loved them, and you provided for them in the midst of, their, of strong enemies. And in our day-to-day, -day, Father, we are faced with the world, the flesh, and the devil. We are faced by those who would persecute your church. In other parts of the world, they see this on a daily basis. And in our community, we see this in more subtle ways. Father God, we thank you that you are a refuge in the midst of persecution. And we pray that for your protection. But we also pray for these other, uh, for people who do not know you. People from, from uh, all parts of the world you have, in fact, Lord, you have chosen us from all parts of the world. Uh, very few of us in this congregation are, are Jewish. You have grafted us in. You have chosen us out of the midst of the nations and brought us here to this place. And you will continue to do so. Lord, uh, we thank you that you have adopted us and made us into your family. And we look forward to the victory in Jesus, a victory that comes with that new Jerusalem that we will celebrate one day in a place where there shall be no tears and there shall be joy, that our names are written on the Lamb's book of life and that you have adopted us. So with singers and dancers, they praise you. Father, these, uh, these times and these, your faithfulness in the midst of, of hard times is uh, something that we can count on, that you are there, that your character does not change, 
that you are from everlasting for everlasting. And in that, we find our joy. Lord, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now let's take a moment uh, again to profess our, confess our sins uh, publicly. And, uh, and then we'll have a moment or two of uh, silent confession and you can concentrate on the things that we've said, but also on your own sins. So let us pray together. Most merciful Father, we have sinned against you and are guilty before you. Forgive us for the sins of our tongues, the sins of our eyes, the sins of our hearts, and above all, for rebelling against your lordship and doubting your love. Holy Father, kill our envy, remove our pride, melt our hearts. Give us grace to be holy, kind, gentle, pure, to live for you and not for ourselves, to be transformed into your likeness, to live holy for your glory. Take away the mourning and give us music. Remove our sackcloth and give us the beauty. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let us pause and confess our own sins. Let us be assured of God's pardon for us. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet my flesh, in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold. Amen. Amen. As we enter this time of doxology and praise, um, do want to remind you of the different ways you can give to the ministry of Potomac Hills Presbyterian Church. So let's rise up and sing about the great faithfulness of our God. Now unto the King who reigns over all.
I'm not used to all these things, so please pardon me. <laughs> if you have your Bible, please turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Um, if you're able, would you please stand with me as we give honor to the uh, reading of God's word. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. So have your Bible beside you because we will be turning to it frequently. Remember, this is God's holy word, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. May the Lord bless the reading of his own word. Please be seated. And let us pray. Our gracious Father, we come before your precious word, your eternal word. Lord, as we hear your word, let not the devil come and snatch the word away from us. But may your word sink deep into our hearts. May your word transform us. May your word equip us to stand against persecutions and tribulations. May your word equip us to stand against the cares of the world, the worldliness the deceitfulness of the riches and the desires for the world. Lord, may your word enable us to produce much fruit, hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. So we pray, Father, at this moment that your Holy Spirit will teach us your word and remove all distractions. Lord, help us to focus upon your truth this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Someone asked me this question. How can you say that those who are not Christians are going to hell? What about the millions of Buddhists? What about the Muslims or the Hindus? How would you answer these questions? Another person may say, I'm a good person, I'm a sincere person, I am nice, religious, spiritual, I help others, I do not harm others, and I'm well respected by others. Therefore, I'm going to heaven. I'm sure you, are, you have often heard these answers. How will you answer such people? 
Let us remember, religions do not save a person. Niceness does not save a person. Good works do not save a person. So you must tell the truth. And truth often hurts. You must tell the gospel. It will offend many people. Salvation for your soul is only possible by Jesus. There is no other means to salvation except Jesus. Salvation is only in Jesus' name. And that's what we are going to examine this morning from this text. We are going to examine this text under five headings. Number one, offense. Number two, persecution. Number three, trial. Number four, response. And fifth, salvation not by any other name. So let us begin by looking at the first heading, offense, verses 1 and 2. If you look at chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, you will read that Peter, the apostle Peter, killed a crippled man at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. The, the name of the gate was Beautiful. And of course, this incident happened in the temple in Jerusalem. There, Peter preached a sermon confirming that it was Jesus of Nazareth who healed the lame man. During his sermon, he deflected all attention, fame, and glory to Jesus. Peter accused the Jews for rejecting Jesus. Listen to what Peter said. Acts chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. But you, pointing to the Jews, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer, referring to Barabbas, to be granted to you and kill the Prince of Life, who is Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. As a witness of Jesus Christ, Peter preached the resurrection of Jesus, and he called them to repent and be converted. The preaching of the gospel offended the Jews. The gospel continues to offend people even today. And it must, because the gospel ultimately wants the hearers to repent and to be converted. Now, who were the offenders? Sorry, who were the offended hearers? We are told, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees. Who are the priests? They administ administered the morning and evening worship services. The, evening, the morning and evening sacrifices. Who was the captain of the temple? He ranked, he ranked second to the high priest. In fact, he was in charge of the temple police. Who were the Sadducees? Uh, this is interesting. They were the educated, wealthy, and elite ones. They were the ones who controlled the Jewish political and religious life. They denied the resurrection of the dead. Now, what exactly offended the hearers? Look at verses 1 and 2. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed. In other words, they were annoyed, grieved, that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. I'm reading from the New King James Version, so please bear with me. The teaching and the preaching concerning Jesus and his resurrection from the dead offended the hearers. Notice, Peter did not preach in the temple in Jerusalem about showing love by bringing social justice to the oppressed and 
social welfare to the poor. He did not, he did not preach about those things. He did not preach the social gospel. He presented the very core of the gospel. Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And we are told in verse 2, this greatly disturbed them. It greatly grieved them, annoyed, and offended them. I want to ask you this. Are you willing to proclaim Jesus and his resurrection from the dead? Clearly the gospel will offend people. It will offend your parents, your family members, your relatives, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, and even your bosses. Because these offended the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees in this text. Then are you prepared to proclaim the gospel that greatly offends people? Now itself you should prepare yourselves Look at Peter and John. They are great, towering examples for us. So ask God to grant you the boldness, the grace and strength as he granted Peter and John. Moreover, sharing the gospel may result in persecution. Why? Because it is offensive. So we must be prepared and be ready to face persecution. Now let us look at what happened to Peter and John. So we come to the second heading, persecution, verses 3 and 4. Look at verse 3. And they laid hands on them. In other words, arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Why did the hearers, the priests, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees arrest Peter and John and put them in jail? They did not rob or kill anyone. They did not incite insurrection. They committed no crime. Yet the Jews were greatly offended by the gospel. They conducted no proper inquiry because it was already evening. No credible charge pronounced. They simply put them in jail until the next day. But then Peter and John, who did no wrong, did not retaliate. They simply submitted to the temple authorities and were held in custody until the next morning. We may ask, why did Peter and John got into this trouble? Why did they get into this trouble? They could have avoided the arrest and persecution if Peter had not healed the crippled man and preached in the temple. Well, because Peter healed the cripple and preached the gospel, Something phenomenal happened. Look at verse 4. However, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. How many were saved? About 5,000 men, women and children are not included. Just the men. How did that happen? They heard the word of God. Whoever heard the word of God believed. Because they believed. They believed because they took the word seriously and reverently as God's word, not as man's word. See, Peter did not lie. But he spoke the truth. He, he did not deceive the hearers with his personal, secular opinions. 
He simply spoke the truth. Whatever they heard from the lips of Peter were absolute truths and objective truths from heaven. Peter preached Christ. Peter preached the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Peter preached faith and repentance. So on that day, 5,000 men heard the absolute truths and believed and was saved. Truly, the church grew by the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. Are you ready to receive persecution? Are you ready to receive verbal abuse, physical abuse, mistreatment for the gospel's sake? Do you fear persecution? Do not be fearful. In church history, we read that many devout men were persecuted. People like Peter, Stephen, Paul, John Wycliffe, John Haas, Martin Luther, Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley. The list goes on. But the church continues to grow, and it grows rapidly, especially during persecution. Look at the churches in the Middle East, Africa, India, China, and other countries. They're growing rapidly. So do not be fearful. Now Peter and John were arrested and jailed for one night. So the trial did not take place until the following day. So we come to the third heading. Trial, verses 5 and 7. 5 through 7. Look at verses 5 and 6. Six. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin gathered on the next day for the trial of Peter and John. The Sanhedrin consists, consisted of three groups of people, the rulers, elders, and scribes. In addition, some other prominent priests were gathered there too. We are told in the text. They were Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest. Now, Annas was not the high priest in power during that time. The high priest in power during the time was his son-in-law, Caiaphas. However, Annas held the honorary title of the high priest. We do not have much information of the other named people in the Sanhedrin. Now, a trial took place to determine whether Peter and John were guilty or not, according to the Jewish law. Hence, it will be interesting to know what law did they violate. The Sanhedrin set Peter and John in the middle and they asked a question. They did not state the charge, but rather asked an interesting subtle question. By what power or by what name have you done this? The Sanhedrin knew that a miracle took place in the temple. A man who was lame since his birth was miraculously healed. The Sanhedrin was very curious to know how. How was the cripple healed? In other words, they acknowledged the miracle, but how did that happen was their dilemma. They wanted to know from whom did they receive the power to perform the miracle? Now, if it was some kind, if it was done through some kind of sorcery, then Peter and John would have been 
sentenced to death according to Deuteronomy chapter 13 verses 1 through 5. If you have the time, please go home and check for yourself. Now, what power or what name, what or who was the source of the power? That was their main concern. And it was a subtle question. It could have been a trap question. How did Peter reply? So we come to the fourth heading response, verses 8 through 11 response. Jesus knew that one day his disciples will be arrested for preaching Christ. So Jesus prepared his disciples how to respond to this kind of situation. In Mark chapter 13, verse 11, there it is written. Jesus said to his disciples, But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Amazing, isn't it? And that is exactly what Peter did. We should remember this when we are in similar situation. Look at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave the right words for Peter to speak. Isn't that a great encouragement to us? In times like this, let us be assured that the Holy Spirit will give us the right words to speak. So Peter addressed the Sanhedrin respectfully, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Here Peter was very careful with his words. He was very respectful. Peter was surprised that they arrested him and John for a good deed of healing a helpless man. And that they wanted to know the means of the healing. Peter insisted that the lame man was not healed by his power, but by the power of Jesus. The healed lame man stood on his feet before the Sanhedrin as a testimony with Peter and John. Now look at verse 10. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man stands here before you whole. Peter wanted everyone in Israel to know by what name the lame man was healed. He stated very clearly that the lame man was healed by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He reminded them that it was Jesus whom they crucified. It was Jesus whom they put to death. It was Jesus whom they re rejected had now healed the lame man. You know, the rejection of Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament, Psalm 118, verse 22. He was the stone who was rejected by the Jews, the builders, but now he has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus was despised, but now he had been exalted to prominence. How? Resurrection. The Jews put Jesus to death, but God raised him from the dead. Without him, without Jesus, the church cannot sustain or persevere. The church stands because of Jesus, the cornerstone. Because Jesus is living. The living Jesus saved the lame man. 
this lame man was lame for 40 years. But now he was well both in body and soul. The healing of the body was necessary. However, far more important and necessary was the salvation of his soul. Salvation of the crippled man was not possible by any other name except the name of Jesus. So we come to the final heading. Salvation not by any other name. Verse 12. Now, Peter finally concludes his reply by a stupendous statement. Look at verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. From this statement, it is very clear that salvation is not found in any other religions. Salvation is not found in the religion of the Pharisees. The Pharisees adopted a legalistic religion. They added more human laws to God's laws. They endeavored to keep all the laws in order to be saved. It was based on works righteousness. Salvation is not found also in the religion of the Sadducees. The Sadducees were anti-supernatural. They denied the existence of demons. They denied the existence of angels. They denied the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. Salvation is not found in the religions of Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. One author said in this way, and I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing it. Today, many people believe that all religions are basically the same. They all teach the same things. For example, many say that Judaism, Islam, and Hinduism teach the same things. Now, the question is this. If they teach the same things, then why did they persecute Christians and are still doing. Read the New Testament Gospels. Why did the Jews persecute Christians? If all religions are the same and teaching the same things. Many say that all religions lead to the same God. It does not matter what religion you choose to live by. All lead to salvation or liberation of the souls. Some others believe that Islam and Christianity worship the same God. Really? Peter did not think so. Peter in this text, nor is there salvation in any other, clearly hammers the impossibility of salvation in other religions. All other religions are excluded. All other religious leaders are excluded too. Muhammad, Guru Nanak, and the list goes on. Truly, it is not the religion that can save a person, but Jesus of Nazareth can save a person. So salvation is found only in Jesus. Look at verse 12 again. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter insists that we can only be saved by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Let us pause here for a while. Saved from what? Saved from sins. What sins? Lying, cheating, stealing, worshipping other gods,
committing adultery, fornication, evil speaking, and so on. The crippled man was not only healed physically, but spiritually through his faith in Jesus of Nazareth. He was saved from his sins as well. You know, we are all born with sins. Sin separates man from the holy God. A sinner will suffer eternal punishment in hell. So God sent Jesus from heaven to earth to save man from their sins and punishment from hell. God gave Jesus to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. This Jesus lived among men. He became the mediator between God and man. His name is Jesus. Meaning he will save his people from their sins. Why did Jesus come into this world? And the answer is found in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And Mary will bring forth his son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The only Savior given to us is Jesus. There is no other name under heaven given among men. Here Peter insists on the exclusivity of Jesus in the salvation of sinners. It means salvation is not possible by any other means, persons, or religions except Jesus. And Peter is not saying something new. He is reiterating what Jesus claimed several weeks ago. Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through me. In these words, Jesus took the name of Jehovah, the great I am, on his lips by claiming, I am the way. Jesus was saying that he is the only way for all sinners to enter heaven. He is the only way to salvation. One author said this about the difference between other religions and Christianity. Quote, The founders of other religions such as Buddha, Confucius, and Muhammad point to the way to their God. But Jesus Christ presents himself as the way to God. He is the way to God, unquote. Now, who can show us the way to heaven unless that person is from heaven? No one has come from heaven to show us the way to heaven except Jesus. He came from heaven and only he can show us the way to heaven. My friends, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This was the conviction of Peter. This is the conviction of the church historically. Is this your conviction? Is Jesus of Nazareth your Lord and Savior? I urge all of you who are not Christians to trust Jesus for only he can save you and safely bring you to heaven. I want to address the children and the young people now. Children and young people. Do not think that since your parents are saved uh, and are believers, thus you can go to heaven. No. God cannot believe for you. Jesus Christ cannot believe for you. 
Your parents cannot believe for you. You must believe in Jesus for yourself. So don't delay in coming to Jesus. Turn away from your sins and believe in Him today. Today is the day of your salvation. Salvation is only found in Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we heard your word. Lord, help us not to be hearers of God's word only, but may we be doers of God's word. Lord, may your word transform us. May your word sink deep into our hearts the absolute truth that we heard from Acts chapter 4. Lord, help us to respond to your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we come to the end of our service, let's rise up and sing about the church's one foundation, Jesus Christ our Lord. Please rise. Church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one o'er all the earth, her charter of salvation. One Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she presses, with every grace endued. The church shall never perish, her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain, and cherish, is with her to the end. Though there be those that hate her, and fall sons in her pale, Against or for traitor, she ever shall prevail. Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.